Well, good morning, you guys. If we haven't met, my name is uh, Nate. I'm the lead pastor here at the Front Church. Perhaps you're new. Uh, perhaps you're from another tradition. Perhaps you're watching online and you're not able to be in the room this morning. Whatever the case may be, uh, we want to say welcome. We're creating the Front Church for you because we want to be a place where as many people as possible experience Jesus' story. And this morning, is a little different than most mornings because this morning we are doing Church Planting Sunday. And we will explain a little bit about that over the course of uh, my message. But last week we actually took a moment and we looked at Acts chapter 17. And if you're unfamiliar with it or if you weren't here last week, that is perfectly okay. We're so glad you're here this morning. But in Acts chapter 17, we see the Apostle Paul in action. If we were to read the whole book of Acts, we would see him in action a few different ways. And what we, what we would come to find out about the Apostle Paul is that his methods change, but his message stays the same. Depending on where he ends up. In Athens, he didn't even quote the Bible. It's kind of wild. He didn't even quote the Bible when he's talking to people about Jesus because the people he was talking to, they weren't familiar with the Bible. So he quoted their, their own poets, their own philosophers, and he was using things that they were familiar with to tell them about the story of Jesus. When you see him in other places, in other contexts, he does other things. And so we are convinced that the methods change, but the message does not. And we want to do whatever possible so that as many people as possible experience Jesus' story. Now, the Apostle Paul, he was also, he was compelled by Jesus' story. You, there, there, there are things you're inspired by, and then there are things that like grab you and will not let you go. And that was so that was what happened with the Apostle Paul. The Jesus story, in a sense, grabbed him and would not let him go. And so because of this, he's like, people got to know. And so um, uh, his desire was to see as many people as possible experience Jesus' story. In fact, Scripture talks about how one day there will be people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language declaring praise to Jesus. So it's Jesus' intention it's the, it's the kingdom of God looks like not a monolithic culture, but a multiplicity of cultures, a multiplicity of languages, a multiplicity of voices. And so the Apostle Paul, he, often, he becomes a student of the people he's trying to share the message of Jesus with, to share the message of Jesus. And he does all this because he has seen Jesus' story bring life when he was trapped in death. And he knows that Jesus' story brings life to a world trapped in death, to people trapped in death, to ways that don't bring life. We were made for a relationship with Jesus, a relationship with God. And so he's doing everything in his power and his ability to communicate this life-changing reality, the story of Jesus to a bunch of different people. And so today on Church Planning Sunday, that's our major focus. And so some of you may even wonder, like, what is a church plant? Like, I thought a church plant was a poncetta. Like, it's a legitimate question. It's kind of a weird word, church plant. I don't know who came up with it. It's not in the Bible. We don't read about church plants in the Bible. We read about churches that are started in the Bible. But church planting is exactly that. It is starting new churches. Why start new churches? Because you want to invite as many people as possible to experience Jesus' story, and different methods reach different types of people. And you can't, like, just do all the methods or you won't reach any of the people. You got to kind of pick your target, so to speak. I mean, Paul's picking his target when he goes to certain cities. Jesus picks his target. He says, like, he's come for, for uh, uh, most of the time, Jesus, when he's ministering, is ministering among Jewish people. Occasionally, he ministers outside of Jewish people. But he knows, like, but I got a guy for that. That guy's going to be Paul. But you got to pick your target. You, 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 you have uh, adopt different strategies to reach different types of people. Um, a couple quick statistics. 
Why do we start new churches? Um, churches three years old and younger, it takes a hundred of their people to reach 10 people for Jesus. If there's a church between 3 and 15 years old, it takes 100 of their people to reach 5 people for Jesus. If a church is older than 15 years old, it takes 100 of its people to reach 3 people for Jesus. The simple reality is the younger a church, the more outward focus it's got to be. You, when you're younger, you, don't, you, you have to be outward focused because you don't have anyone in here. And the older church, the more you get used to one another, the more you get used to seeing those familiar faces, the more you get used to just kind of a way of being and doing church, and the less focused you become on those outside of your church walls. Inviting as many people as possible to experience Jesus' story is best done through starting new churches. It's actually the thing that kind of gets... It's, get, get, it shares this story. Don't we have enough churches? Well, that's a good question, too. In 1900, there were 28 churches for every 10,000 Americans. In 1950, there were 17 churches for every 10,000 Americans. In, in 2000, there were 12 for every 10,000 Americans. And in 2004, there were, there were 11 for every 10,000 Americans. I think the number is even smaller. Now, the number of churches has increased 50% since 1900. But the population has increased by 300%. So the number of churches isn't keeping up with the number of people around. Consider these statistics. Each year, 3,700 churches close their doors permanently. And each year, we open 4,000 churches. So that's a net gain of 300 churches per year. In the United States right now, there is one church for every 1,000 people. And currently, um, we're, we have, we're netting 300 churches because 4,000... 3,700 closed, but 4,000 open, so there's a net of 300. But to keep up with the one church per 1,000 people, you actually need to net 1,900 new churches per year. We're just not doing enough. It's not, it's, it's not happening quick enough. And four of the five churches that do exist are plateaued or declining. And so church planting, it's not about starting new churches to start new churches, the reason we plant churches is because we want to invite as many people as possible to experience Jesus' story. It's because the younger a church, the more outward focused it is. It's because the younger a church, the more effective it is at sharing the story of Jesus with those outside of the church. It's because younger churches, when an older church sees a younger church, they can kind of get locked in a tunnel vision like, oh, this is how we do things. This is how we've always done things. But then you see someone doing something different and you're like, oh, we could do that. So another reason to start new churches is to, get, is to get ideas for churches that have been around a while that, hey, we could do that. And so um, I want to introduce this morning my friend David Henderson to you guys. He's played drums here. He's led worship here. He's given the message here. And maybe you know, but maybe you don't. But he and his family are planting Neighborhood Church in Daybreak. And, um, and so we're going to learn a little bit about um, them in a minute. But we don't think the front church is enough to reach the Salt Lake Valley. We think we need a multiplicity of churches to reach a multiplicity of people because the methods change and the, and the areas change and there are going to be people that David and, day, and, and neighborhood church reach in Daybreak that we aren't going to be able to reach here in Bluffdell and vice versa. Methods change, but the reality is the story of Jesus brings life in a world trapped in death. And so we need to get that story out there. So if you will, take a look at this short video and then David's gonna come up. Something new has begun with churches represented all across America. In faith, we are believing God to do more than we can ask or think. As we look coast to coast at the faithful leaders of the Converge movement, what will God do? How will he move in a new and fresh way? What is the potential for lives to be changed and for God to be magnified like never before? To reach more people with the gospel, Converge Churches have committed to plant 15 new churches in the Northeast, 30 in the Mid-Atlantic, 60 in Mid-America, 50 in North Central, seven in Heartland, 25 in the Great Lakes, 
15 in Rocky Mountain, 25 in the Northwest, 25 in the Pacwest, 35 in the Southwest, and 25 new church plants in the Southeast. That's 312 new churches from coast to coast by 2026. If each of these churches grew to only 200 people, that would be over 60,000 lives impacted. New churches reach new people in new ways. Let's start something new. So Converge is the network of non-denominational Christian churches that the front is a part of. So we are one of the 312. Neighborhood Church is one of the 312 that they want to seek to start. And so David, how is Hello. kids camp, man? You guys uh, don't know, but like okay. last week, David calls me on Saturday. Yeah, Saturday or And Sunday. he's like, bro, we thought we we're going to have 30 kids. We have like... 50 kids registered right now. We need some help. Can you put out a plea to your people? Can, <laughs> can you get, can, and, and, you know, you could hear the desperation in his voice, but we gave him, we, 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 we yeah. some people showed up, but yeah. Seven people how, from seven the people front from showed the up. Front. You guys I mean, come are on. awesome. Yeah. 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 And so how was it though? Yeah. I mean, it's fantastic. First, I have to give a special shout out to Andrew and Eva who came all week and I told Andrew on Sunday morning when he was like, yeah, I think we can help out. I was like, you're going to run the soundboard. You just got to push a couple of buttons. And he showed up Tuesday and I said, you're leading a kid's class. Have fun. <laughs> so, so that was awesome. Yeah. Uh, my wife, Victoria, planned the whole entire thing. I really had very little to do with it except showing up. So can we give her a round of applause yeah. first before I tell you how it was? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we had... Yeah, yeah, over about 55 kids show up, over 50 kids. So um, you guys haven't just, had a Sunday service. You haven't we met haven't had on a, Sundays. No. You just had 55 we had a, we had a kids. block party on May 21st. Okay. okay. Um, I think there's a couple of pictures of that here, and so uh, maybe we, we zoomed by them. But, um, yeah, so here's, here's from the block party. We just made a whole bunch of connections. We had a little table out, said, hey, we're having make ways with neighborhood kids, a kids camp coming up, and uh, bring your kids. And um, something about that worked. Um, we had a blast. Our theme, again, was make waves, which uh, basically means uh, the things you do today can change the world around you. Uh, God made people with a purpose. We can trust Jesus with our lives, um, and God can help you change the world around you. One of those pictures um, was my son, Joel, with uh, this one. So this is Joel on your left and his friend, Percy, on the right. The funny thing about this is... Um, we found out at the block party, Percy and his family live like three blocks from us. Uh, Joel and Percy were in the same three-year-old uh, preschool class, cool. and they were inseparable. Then they were separate for four-year-old class, and this was like their reunion a year later, and they just had an absolute blast. Really? Percy came up, and um, one of our leaders was like, okay, we're going to pray, and Percy comes up and takes the microphone. He's like, I would like to pray. <laughs> and so, he, so he prayed. He led a, a, a room full of 55 kids plus, you know, about 20, 25 adults um, in a prayer. And it was just absolutely amazing. So kids camp was uh, wonderful. One of the things we wanted to do was um, just kind of love the school that allowed us to rent from them. Um, so we shared, uh, we had lunch for our volunteers and we shared with the principal and one of their administrators and um, the uh, custodian of the school told us, I said, Nick, is there anything else, you know, we need to do? If, you know, if we broke anything, please let us know. And he said, I've never had a group clean up this much. You guys are good. Yeah. So that was just a huge, huge win for us to just be able to um, not just be in the school, but also bless the school that we were renting from. Totally. Totally. Uh, tell us, tell us about yourself, your family. Yes. They don't know you. Yeah. I know you. So I'm a, a Philly suburbs kid, born and bred. So if I talk too fast, just raise your hand and slow me down. Uh, my wife, Victoria, is from northeastern Kansas, and we met at Penn State University in the, uh, the Navigators, which is a campus ministry. And um, from there, we moved to Chicago, then Dallas, then Denver, then here, uh, slowly zigzagging our way west. And we have... Um, five-year-old son named Joel, who you just saw, and this is our, she's 17 months now, our daughter, Wren, um, and they're just so fascinatingly different in their personalities. It's hard to believe them every day, but I'm a huge coffee snob. Okay. Uh, Victoria is as well. We freely admit that. We love hiking. 
Um, and we like doing best, some other things, Who has the best coffee in the Salt Lake Valley? Do you agree? I don't know that I can legally endorse someone right now. Okay, okay. okay. Snob, I also but. thought maybe we'd have like a good <laughs> fight on our hands. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'll say okay. your coffee on Sunday mornings is on the right track. So, okay, okay. Yeah. Hey, if you know where that hey. comes from, you're on a, you have a good start. La Barba Coffee. <laughs> Shout out. Thank you, La Barba, for your amazing coffee that we brew here at the front. That's if right. you want to give us discounts, we will take them. Yes. Um, Free advertising. There it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> oh, man, we've never sp we never had a sponsor before. You never That's know. Right. You want to sponsor Kids Camp? Um, why did you guys move to Utah? Why, and why Daybreak? Yes. That's a really wonderful question. Uh, the short answer is the Lord told us to move to Utah. Um, I was sitting in, I was a staff member uh, on, at a church in the Denver area, and I was sitting at a short-term missions team informational meeting. Um, this trip ended up falling through, but the Lord used it in our lives in, uh, in a pretty big way, and uh, he just broke my heart at that meeting for Utah. And uh, I went home and didn't tell Victoria for a long time that I thought the Lord was calling us to plant a church here in Utah. And um, we were supposed to go to a, uh, so Converge, 312 churches, um, they have a church planning assessment center, and about two weeks before I found out that we were, we were supposed to be observers, just go watch the process, and I found out um, that they had gotten our registration wrong and they had put us down as candidates. And our lead pastor, who was my boss at the time, said, oh, I'll, I'll get it fixed. Don't worry about it. Well, I said, well, let's talk about this. So we had two weeks to prepare for the church planting assessment So they center. tricked you. They, I think they did. I think there was yeah, something. Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Um, but at that church planting assessment, uh, and this was before we had ever even visited Utah, uh, we called our hypothetical church at the time Daybreak Church. And eight months later, we came and visited Salt Lake Valley, and we met another pastor here. And he said, oh, you want to plant a church in Daybreak? I said, no, we want to plant Daybreak Church. Yeah, in Daybreak. What are you talking about, dude? Why do you keep saying in? And uh, so he said, you have to come to our house for dinner tonight. And he gave us kind of the driving tour and drove us all around Daybreak. And Victoria and I just knew, yeah, this, is, <laughs> this guy was right. We're going to plant a church in Daybreak. And so... Our name has since changed. Uh, we kind of thought about, uh, let's not get sued. We hear that's not good for church plants. So um, what are the parts of Daybreak that draw people in? And it's the community. It's the, um, you know, all the garages are like in the back of the houses on alleys so that everyone can have front porches and interact with each other. And so we said, yeah, it's the neighborhood. It's, it's not just like the place of neighborhood, but it's neighborhood, like living out your sense of neighborhood with the people around you. So... Um, we think of neighborhood as the category that will always put two people together, if you use Jesus' definition in Luke 10. Okay, okay. So tell us about neighborhood, neighborhood church. church. Yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. I read your mind. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> that could so, be dangerous. So, uh, yeah, at Neighborhood Church, we say we want to lead our neighbors to life-changing relationships with Jesus. We believe that when you meet Jesus, everything changes. Not that everything is perfect in your life, not that everything just all of a sudden, all the puzzle pieces fit together, but everything has a new perspective to it. There's a, a deeper spiritual sense to everything when you meet Jesus, and he's always with you, and so he's the, he's the comforter, right? He's the, um, he's the healer, he's the encourager, and so um, when we talk about Neighborhood Church, we say that it's a place where you don't have to measure up. Yeah. Uh, we live in a place in Utah, uh, when Victoria and I talk about it, we call it the keep it together culture. That says you've got to have it all together. You've got to measure up on the inside and on the outside. You've, you've got to have it all together. And so we say you don't have to have it all together. This is a place where you can come when you know you don't have it together. Um, because, uh, you know, the, the, the culture says keep it together. There's a standard you've got to meet. And we meet a lot of people who say, you know what? There's a standard I'm supposed to meet, and I'm just learning that I can't meet it. And I don't know what to do. And so we say... You're right, you can't meet it because the standard you've been told is impossible. But Jesus made a better way. And so that's what Neighborhood Church is all about, is sharing with people there is a better way, a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Yes, yes. What are you most excited about right now for Neighborhood Church? Yes, great question. So coming off the heels of Block Party and Make Waves with Neighborhood Kids, we have a lot of 
people we've connected with that are sort of right now, because those things just happened, they're sort of floating out there. So I'm really excited right now to say, hey, let's get together. Let's connect on a deeper level. Uh, throughout this summer, we have three meet and greets where we're going to have people come out. It's just kind of like who we are, why we're here, what are we doing? Would you like to be a part of it? Um, and every Sunday this summer, with the exception of Father's Day and Fourth of July weekend, uh, we are having what we're calling Sunday socials in a park by our house and just saying, hey, no pressure, just come. We'll provide some, you know, main dish and we'll provide all of dinner. You can bring a side or dessert if you want. And we just want to connect with you. We just want to tell you why we're here and give you some information and um, build the team. So that's what I'm really excited for right now is, is building connections, building a team of people who say, yes, we want more gospel-centered churches right here and we want to be a part of this. I love it. I love it. What is the, what's the biggest challenge you're facing right now? <laughs> I, he laughs. I, I have to, I, everything, can I say everything? I have to preface this one because sometimes people will, I, I know this, sometimes people say this one and, and you think like, is this really a, like a, a, a challenge or is this a, like a question that's veiled as a, this is a challenge we're facing? It's really a challenge that we're facing. I'm not making any kind of ask this morning. But I don't know if you've noticed that gas was like five sixty something a gallon, or diesel, I guess. But gas is right around five. Do you drive a diesel? Five a gallon. I do not drive a diesel. Oh, okay. Praise God. Wow, wow. Um, so fundraising is tough right now. Mm -hmm. Support discovery is what someone once told me we should call it because God has all of it. He has. Uh, he can supply every one of our needs. It's all out there. We just have to go and discover where it is. Um, turning rocks over uh, is is kind of tough right now, mm -hmm. um, searching for that discovery, so that, yeah. for that support. So that's yeah. where we're at. That's the biggest yeah. challenge. We've been there. We've been there. Yes, you have. I know. Some, of you guys, some of you guys might not know about that, that, I mean, that part of our story, but I mean, right now, Front Church is 20% of our funding, which is a big deal, comes from people who are part of the Front Church, yeah, which awesome. is amazing, but that also means 80% comes from people outside the Front who believe in what we're doing and who are giving. Now, last year at this time, 100%. Yeah. of what we needed came from outside the front. And so uh, the Lord is moving, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's quite a whirlwind. It's every church planter's favorite part of church planting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's what they told you. say that with a very they told you at the assessment they tricked you into yeah. coming. To, that's right. Right? Yeah, yeah. You're gonna, It'll be fine. You'll do great. Part. You can do this. Uh-huh, uh-huh. What, <laughs> so what word of advice would you give to someone else who's mm. thinking about either participating in a church plant or leading a church plant one day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had a lot of people. Uh, I mean, we had, we had as many people telling us, yes, you know, we believe in you. Um, follow Jesus and, and, you know, he will do this through you. We had just as many, if not more, people say, why are you doing this? This seems like a bad idea. Uh, you know, where is the money going to come from? Where is this going to come from? Where are the people going to come from? Um, and a lot of people that basically said, don't, you shouldn't do this. Don't do this. Now, I, I would agree to the extent that you need to be sure that you know that you're sure that you know you're called to plant a church. But the advice that I would give is when we're following Jesus, crazy and is normal and normal is crazy. If we're not living a crazy life chasing after Jesus and what he has in store for us and receiving his spirit and his love and pouring it out on other people, then what are we doing? Then why are we here? If we're not willing to be fools, Jesus told his followers to, to pick up your cross and carry me. That, that meant ridicule. That meant something totally not within what the culture, someone in that culture would have wanted to do. It was crazy, but crazy is normal when you're following Jesus, and normal is crazy. Why would you live a normal, vanilla, plain life and look like everybody else who's out there who doesn't know Jesus when we have the best news in the world? Do you guys write that down? <laughs> when you're following Jesus, crazy is normal, and normal is crazy. That's so good. But can I just say that, like, that's so good. Meeting at church, like having a church service on a Sunday morning in a school, that's crazy. It is like, crazy. what are y'all doing? Yeah. 
but crazy's normal. Yeah. Like, why, why would we not do this? Having a kid's camp before you even have a Sunday service, that's crazy. We have people like, what are you doing? Who are you even? Mm. Crazy's normal. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, tell us how we can be praying for you. Like, what is a God-sized request yes. that we can join in prayer with you guys? Yes, yes, yes. Um, can I? I have, I have three. I'm cheating. I didn't ask you for three, David. I know. I'm sorry. Right. We're good. We're good. We're, so good. we're gonna. The two of them kind of lead to the one. So I, right now, like what I said, we're that? we're. This is the leading to the one. This is, is bowling. Bowling? Bowling. bowling. Okay. Okay. okay Strike. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm a terrible nice. bowler. I'm feeling very triggered. I now. bet you're worse. I bet I'm worse than you. I I'm, don't know. Our mission team that was in town last go, week man. asked me to go with them, and I was let's going go. to. And, one of them asked me, what's your best score ever? And I was like, I don't know, like 120. And he laughed at me. This was a high school kid. We'll get out the bumpers for you, man. I'll That'd take them. Fine. Can I get the ramp, too, where I just drop the ball? Yeah, okay, yeah. awesome. Okay, my three, <laughs> three prayer requests in one. The first is, again, as we're, like I said, we're really excited about building a team. Um, and so pray that 10 families would stick and say, yes, we are committed to this. We want to see Neighborhood Church off the ground. Uh, another one is, as I, I mentioned, fundraising. Again, this is not a, like a backdoor ask. This is just a please pray for them. Mm-hmm. We could really... Pause. You, oh. If you want to give to Neighborhood <laughs> Church, you should. This is Nate so, talking, not me. Um, I mean, keep going. <laughs> okay. okay. We could really use about another $5,000 a month to be in a healthy financial position that's sustainable. Because like Nate, Nate said, I mean, I'm amazed that you, like, you guys are awesome. That 20% of the front's funding is coming from you guys. That's incredible. Um, we have some fantastic team members that are probably about 2% of our giving right now. So, like, 98 is from outside. So, we needed about a 5000 a month to say, like, yes, we're solid. We can sustain and get to the point where we can build up just like you guys 20% coming in. So here's the big one. So these two lead to um, this last one, those two. Daybreak, so I have to describe Daybreak a little bit here. Daybreak's broken up into like 13 to 15 villages right now. It's huge. It's got like almost 30,000 people, if not more by now. It's supposed to be like at least double that in the next 10 to 15 years. So it's broken up into villages. They're adding more villages. God is convicting us to ask the question, why can't we plant a church in every village of daybreak? And that doesn't mean that every one of them is kind of this like meets in a brick and mortar building on Sunday. What happens if we meet at the coffee shop on Sunday? And yeah, we want to have a few of these kind of hubs, these, these big Sunday services, but, but what does it look like to have a church in every village of daybreak? And so that's that's our big prayer right now. That's what we're asking the Lord for. So pray the neighborhood church could plant a church in every village at daybreak. Yes. I can't give you a number for that right now because they're building more and more villages. But that's where we're headed. Okay. Yes. Can we pray for the Hendersons right now? Victoria, can you come up here? Okay. Okay. I didn't either. Dear God, we thank you for David and Victoria and Joel and Wren, and we thank you that you don't just call one person, you call the family, and you brought them here because they want to see as many people as possible experience your story. We thank you that you put the name Daybreak on their minds and in their hearts before they ever knew that a Daybreak Utah existed. That is your work. We thank you that you have affirmed and confirmed their calling over and over and over again. And right now, God, we join with them in praying for 10 families to say yes to being a part of Neighborhood Church. And like a big yes, not like a periphery on the edge yes, but like a we're all in yes. God, we pray that you would continue to provide. We know that the scripture says you own the cattle on a thousand hills, which just means like resources are not a problem for you. And so we pray that you would connect them with people who can help fund the vision of Neighborhood Church so that people come to know you, Jesus, so that people are invited into relationship with you. And yes, God, we join them 
and praying for many, many, many churches all over the Salt Lake Valley and specifically for a church in every village at Daybreak. We thank you for how you're you're helping them dream. We thank you for placing them where you are. And we thank you for a crazy successful kids camp. And we just, we, 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 we ask you to bless them. And we ask you to move through them, Jesus. In your name, amen. amen. Thank you, guys. Give it up for David and Victoria, you guys. Shortest message you've ever heard in your life. You ready? Let me read a passage of scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, 17 through 20. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. And all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. I love that term, ambassador. An ambassador is a representative. If I was an ambassador of the United States and I lived in a foreign country like Japan, my goal as an ambassador of the United States is to represent the aims, the values, the, the country of the United States in that foreign territory. I'm an ambassador of the United States to Japan. Scripture says that we're ambassadors. Like we're literally like, this is not our home. Sometimes we want to make it our home, but like the kingdom of God is our home. And when we go about, when we live, when we go through everyday life, we are an ambassador of Jesus to those around us. We are an extension of God's presence to those around us. God makes his appeal through uh, 17 years ago, my life was changed. I thought I was going to be hired. I, I was hired to lead worship for an organization. What I didn't realize what the, was the organization was a church planting focused organization. And over the course of a summer, um, 17 years ago, young college kid leading music, I saw new church after new church after new church after new church love on its community care for its community, exist not for those within the walls of the church building, but most of them didn't even have buildings, but exist for those outside of the church building. I saw churches wrestling with the question, if we disappeared, would our community even notice? And they wanted their community to notice. They wanted to live as an ambassador of Jesus' kingdom to the communities around them. 17 years ago, I realized something was a lie. The poem. You guys know the rhyme? Here is the church, here is the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. I mean, that's a lie. This is not the church. This is the church. The people are the church. And the church is only really living into its role as the church when we live into the life that God has called us to. Did you catch it in Paul's words to the Corinthians? He says that God has reconciled us so that we can, reconciled means, means being made right. God has made us right with him so that we can be ministers of reconciliation to the world around us. We're made right with God so then we can be agents of reconciliation around us. We're ambassadors. We're saved not just for ourselves, but we're saved to be savers. <laughs> we're healed to be healers. We're rescued to be rescuers. That's what the Apostle Paul says, and sometimes, especially in the older church gets, churches can forget why God has rescued us. And our churches can begin to look a little more like shopping malls, where we exist to meet the spiritual needs of, and we're, 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 we're a place of spiritual goods and services. Often the older a church gets, the more a consumer mentality can take effect where this is for me. Me, me, me. I, I, I. My, my, my. And we can forget that God has reconciled us to be 
agents of reconciliation. God has rescued us, so we are ambassadors of his kingdom to the world around us. We can forget that as Jesus' people, the church is actually supposed to be a community for those not yet a part of the community. Why? So that a world trapped in death can experience Jesus' life. The front church, we want to be ambassadors. Neighborhood church, they want to be ambassadors. This is the calling of all churches to be ambassadors. And the beautiful thing about starting new churches is starting new churches is like a shot in the arm to the older churches that have been around for a while. You know, we need each other. We're not like, get rid of the older churches. We only need new churches. No, we need each other. In fact, you just heard David talk about funding. Like, if you don't have people in your church yet, you can't be funded yet. You know, like, so you need older churches who believe in the vision of younger churches and who are giving and who are helping and who are generous and who are supporting. And so newer churches need older churches. Older churches need newer churches because they're reminded, oh, we could do this. We could do this in our community. We could live in this way. Oh, that's a good idea. Oh, why haven't we thought of this before? The kingdom of God needs a multiplicity of methods and a multiplicity of churches because the message doesn't change, but the methods always change. Because the goal is not to play our favorite music. And the goal is not to always sit in the same seat. And the goal is not to build a building. And the goal is not... The goal is to see as many people as possible hear and experience Jesus' story. And so we want to do whatever it takes to adapt and keep adapting. To plant churches to see more churches planted. We believe that the last thing I want to say about this passage is that it's pretty clear that inner renewal is meant to lead to outer renewal. And so we need to be a people continually asking the Spirit of God to fill us, to lead us, to guide us, and to sustain us so that we can be his ambassadors and agents of reconciliation to the world around us. Can we pray? God, we thank you so much for the work you're doing in our midst. We thank you so much for the work you're doing in Neighborhood Church. We thank you for the work you're doing all around the world um, as churches that look different, that are different, that are reaching different neighborhoods and different communities and different people groups and languages and nations. We thank you that um, um, as, these, as, as, as people are seeking to be ambassadors of you, seeking to be an extension of your presence to the world around them, that you are doing a work in other people's lives. You are bringing life in a world trapped in death. Your, Jesus, is, your story brings life to us when we're trapped in death. And I don't know where anyone else is in this room, Lord, but I know that some of us can feel it quite trapped right now. And we need to experience your life. Spirit of God, breathe your life into us. Use us. In your name.